it's time for sports. Good afternoon and welcome to LTCC Sports. I'm Ian Lindsay. And I'm John Marrero. We start off today's show by going straight to the NFL. Now that we're into free agency, some trades are making the headlines. For all those New York Jet fans out there, Darrell Reeves is coming home. The Jets have given him a five-year contract worth $70 million. Revis became a free agent on Tuesday after the New England Patriots declined to pick up a $20 million option to retain him next season. Revis had played for the Jets from 2007 to 2012, and New York getting him back was one of the biggest transactions of the day. What do you think of Revis being reunited with the Jets? Revis returning to the Jets once again brings the team back to a possible contender in the AFC East. Revis, of course, went from the Jets to the Bucks in Tampa in 2013, and then he signed with the rival of the Jets, the New England Patriots, in 2014. He tore his ACL in 2012 and, due to contract disputes, got traded from the Jets. Although Revis is considered to be one of, if not the best corners in the NFL, the Jets still need to make more moves to improve their team. I agree. I think it's a good move for the Jets. Even though they may have had to pay more than they wanted to, they had to outbid the Patriots here. They really needed to bring in a guy like Revis, and bringing in an all-pro corner will definitely help improve their defense. And, you know, his impact is going to be significant. Since there's already been talks that he's going to recruit Antonio Cromartie to come back, so that will also shore up the de defense for the Jets. Like you said, even though this helps the defense greatly, the questions for the Jets remain mostly on the offensive side of the ball, especially at the quarterback position. Definitely. Another one of the big announcements from free agency, day one, was the trade of New Orleans Saints tight end Jimmy Graham to the Seattle Seahawks. On Tuesday, he did just one thing in response. He deleted his bio on Twitter and instead wrote, traded. Then on Wednesday, he went to... On Wednesday, he went to Twitter again, but this time to thank Saints fans for their support, saying thank you, Houdat Nation, and the city for all your support, love, and hospitality. And to my brothers I played with over the years, thank you. The Saints in return received center Max Unger and Seattle's 2015 first-round pick in exchange for Graham and the Saints' fourth-round pick in 2015. Ian, what do you think about the trade and what Graham first put on Twitter about it? I think Graham may have gone about it the wrong way at first. He probably shouldn't have done that. Probably ticked off Saints fans a little bit. But, you know, he kind of redeemed himself on that second day by coming out and saying, you know, I apologize for that and thanking the Saints and their fans. Obviously, for the Saints, this is a big loss. Drew Brees loses a huge weapon on that team, arguably the best player on that offense. And on the other end, Graham be instantly becomes the best wide receiver on that Seattle team. Russell Wilson now has a dynamic threat in the passing game, especially in the red zone, where Jimmy Graham is absolutely lethal. Very true. Uh, Jimmy Graham could be seen as the best NFL tight end since Tony Gonzalez. Since he came into the league in 2010, Graham has been averaging 12.3 yards per reception and has 51 career touchdowns. He transformed not only the Saints offense into the powerhouse that many experts see them as, but he also changed the way the position is played today. He obviously was upset about being traded from the Saints, but now he has a chance to win another Super Bowl with the Seahawks, and Seattle now becomes a favorite once again to win the NFC. Aside from the Revis and Graham trades, other noteworthy transactions were the Detroit Lions acquiring Haloti Nada and the Eagles trading a second-round pick and Nick Foles for Rams quarterback Sam Bradford. Now we turn to baseball, where somebody needs to tell the Cubs that spring training is not a home run derby. Jorge Soler, Javier Baez, and Chris Bryant hit back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back home runs in the fourth inning against Twins pitcher Trevor Bauer. It was the first home run of the spring for Soler and Baez, and the second for Bryant, who led the minor leagues last year with 43. The Mets are trying to figure out their shortstop situation before April comes. As of right now, Wilmer Flores is the starter, but if he starts to slip, it is possible that Matt Reynolds could get the call. Scouts say Reynolds is the best defensive middle infielder in the organization. If that's a compliment or not, that's for you to decide. There is also speculation that the Mets could get Troy Tulowitzki two months into the season if the Rockies are not winning. One thing the Mets don't seem to have to worry about is the dark knight Matt Harvey. In his first live game after Tommy John surgery, he pitched two scoreless innings where he recorded three strikeouts and broke a bat, hitting 99 miles per hour. He also has a curveball that he claims he did not have before surgery and had no setbacks after the game. The Yankees have hired Hideki Matsui as a special advisor to general manager Brian Cashman. 
Matsui played his first seven seasons with the Yankees and was a fan favorite in his playing days. He will now visit teams in the Yankees farm system working on hitting with managers, coaches, and players. The expectations for the Yankees are high this season, and General Manager Brian Cashman said if they are a good enough team to get into the playoffs and he is allowed to make tweaks during the season, that they will be good enough to win a World Series. The team has a better lineup than most people think. Part of that is Alex Rodriguez, who has been hitting the ball well so far this spring, as well as pitcher Michael Pineda, who has been striking out batters with ease. Pineda will be important this season because of Yankees starting pitcher Masahiro Tanaka's elbow issues. Tanaka will have all eyes on him tonight when he makes his start against the Braves at 7.05. Into basketball, Kobe Bryant has been playing in the NBA since 1996, but he doesn't plan on stopping now regardless of his production and health. When a reporter asked him about his retirement, he just brushed it off. LeBron James is now the career leader in assists for the Cleveland Cavaliers after a James Jones three-pointer on Tuesday night. It marked assist number 4,207, surpassing Mark Price for the career record. Before leaving for a four-year stint in Miami, James was the Cavaliers' all-time leader in points, attempted three-pointers made, attempted free throws made, and also leader in attempted steals and minutes played, and that was only in seven seasons. I'm Will Matusik, and when we come back, I'll recap the Marist men's and women's basketball teams and how they fared in the MAC tournament this past weekend. We'll be back. Really? The time you're late. Really? Shit. Sure. Yeah, she says it's on the dot. Cool. We'll get over here, guys on the right. Flip yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Everything's flipped. So we're coming back, camera two. Okay. And then we're going to the, just the intro, and then we're going to the package. Right. Immediately, okay. right? Yeah. Okay. Back to camera two. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no we, we can't, can't hear anything. Is there is there any way we can get the sound? Yep. <coughs> okay, and they're gonna come in and swap my mic. Yeah. Can is there any way we can hear like we would be able to hear the sounds though? Because we can't hear anything. Forty. Okay. Yeah, it's not a huge deal, but we just can't hear any sound in here. Yeah, we can't. We're kind of. What? We can't. We can't hear any of the sounds or anything or any of it. I mean, it's not the biggest deal. So I'm just going to read the intro, and yeah. then you're throwing it to the package. Yep, yep, yeah. How are we opening? Are you just talking? I think so. Is Thanks for joining us at LTCC Sports, now to Marist Basketball. We head to reporter Will Matuzak for more on what happened this weekend at the MAC tournament in Albany. The Marist men's and women's basketball team were in action this past weekend competing in the MAC tournament in Albany, New York. The Marist men's team finished the regular season with a record of 6-24, and good enough for the 11th seed. In their opening round, the Red Foxes squared off against number six Quinnipiac, a team they lost to twice in conference play. Senior captain Manny Thomas spoke about the win. Um, well, I feel like we beat a tough team in Quinnipiac, the number six team. But they definitely were favorites, and uh, I don't think anybody, any, not a lot of people had us beating them. So we came up with a great energy, and we we had a good win. In the next round, Maris fell to eventual MAC champion Manhattan, 74 to 58. Despite the loss, Thomas sees the season as a success. I just want everybody to recognize uh, where we were at the beginning of the year, being having a losing season, just continuing to work hard, and just know that when you're at the bottom, it's, there's no reason you can't get back to the top. Just continue to work hard no matter what. 
On the women's side, the Lady Red Foxes earned the number two seed and beat St. Peter's and Fairfield before losing to top seed at Quinnipiac. It was the first time the Maris has not won the Max in over a decade. Senior guard Natalie Gomez touched upon the disappointment of the loss. It was just unfortunate because we gave everything we got and we still came up short um, in the championship game in Quinnipiac and we lost by 11 and then you know seeing them celebrate in the end and jumping up and down and it, it was you know disappointing to lose. Despite the loss, Norris will play in the WNIT next weekend. It's a postseason tournament. It just shows that our season's not over, so we're going to keep fighting. The Lady Red Foxes will return to action on March 18th. For LTT Sports, I'm Will Matuzic. Thanks, Will. Now we turn to Studio B, where, where Pat Eaker is with Marist men's basketball player Siobhan Lewis to hear more about the tournament, this season, and how he broke Maris all-time scoring record. Pat? So really, really big for, really big for Siobhan to break the record, especially in the MAC tournament, beating uh, the heavily favored Quinnipiac team. We were coming in as the 11th seed, beating a team as the underdog. Really, really huge step for the Maris basketball team. Yeah, you know, it was good. Uh, you know, to get a win in the tournament is definitely nice, you know, regardless of how your season went. And unfortunately for the women, they don't get to advance very far in the tournament this year. They get defeated, you know, only winning a game. You know, it's disappointing, but unfortunately, you look back, and it was a good year. It was, I mean, we finished uh, second overall. So it Everybody cheering and worrying about me scoring that um, or, or breaking the achievements. So, I mean, on top of that, getting the win also made it a lot more memorable. It made it that, that much of an experience, so... It, it was a great experience. I mean, our teammates, we came out and we, we played really hard. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a really interesting game to be a part of. And, I mean, I'm blessed to be able to be a part of such achievement. You're doing a lot for the program. Obviously, being the all-time scoring leader. Uh, but you also have the record um, for field goal attempts, free throw attempts, free throws made, and tied for first in games played, as well as a two-time captain. Were you aware uh, you were going to play such a big part for the program since your freshman year? I mean, funny thing is, like, that was a part of why I made the decision to come to Maris. I mean, I, there was teams that I could have been, I, I could have went on that I wouldn't have had to play such a major role, but that's what I did going into high school. I, I went, I joined the team where I would have to play a major role, and I enjoyed it, and I, I made a difference, and success is so much better when you can make a difference, so my goal was to come to Maris and be that guy to make that difference and the result was um, breaking all these milestones and achieving everything that I've, I've achieved and I mean I would like to trade it all for a championship but I mean it's been a blessing and I, I expected to eventually get to where I'm at now and I'm here so I'm, I'm blessed to be here. Can you talk about the, uh, the season? You guys have a lot of adversity a lot of injuries to a lot of the starters. It must have been a uh, difficult season. Can you tell me about some of the ups and downs? Um, definitely. I mean, this is probably one of the craziest seasons I've been a part of. Uh, TJ breaking his hand the first game into um, the season, and then Khalid the second game. And they were out for like 13 to 14 games. And then at, at one point, it was I was out with them. It was all three of us out. And it, it was, it was kind of hard to watch, but I mean, that's what makes sports and basketball so amazing. It, it turns um, boys into men, and it, you grow so much through it, and you learn so much about yourself and everyday life that, I mean, it, there's no regrets. And I, I've embraced the obstacles that I've faced, and that just shows the toughness and the character of who you really are. And I mean, I take pride in toughness. So, I mean, it was, it was a roller coaster ride. You had uh, the all rookie team your freshman year, third team all Mac sophomore year, second team all Mac junior year, as well as second team all Mac this year. What has the uh, four years in the Mac conference been like for you? Uh, it's it's definitely cooled down. I mean, 
when I first got here my freshman year, it was it was a handful. I mean, the the freshmen that I came in with, it, they they were really talented, and then also the guys who were, who who were already in the, in the conference are just straight men. So I mean, it, it was it was really interesting. It was tough, but as you grow and develop and enhance your game, you you started to fit in, and that's what I did. Well, thank you for your time. We wish you the best of luck in the future. I'm Patch Kaker. Back to you guys. After the break, I'll be coming back at you live from Tennis Stadium with a report on the men's baseball team. Stay tuned. Okay. Awesome. That's cool. Appreciate it. How much going on? And then we're going to here. Welcome back to LTCC Sports. We continue now with Maris Athletics going to some of this year's spring sports. First off, in men's lacrosse, the team lost their home opener last week 14-10 against Stony Brook. Junior Joseph Radin and senior Colleen Joka both recorded hat tricks for the Red Foxes. On the other side, senior Mike Rooney and juniors Brody Eastwood and Chris Hughes posted hat tricks of their own. Both goalies had eight saves each. The first goal of the game came only 51 seconds in by Joka. An illegal equipment penalty on the Seawolves gave Maris a three-minute power play where the three man-up goals sparked a Maris comeback in the third quarter. The Red Foxes trailed 10-9 in the final corner, but the deficit only grew from there, resulting in a 14-10 loss. Their record now stands at 3-2, and they play this Saturday at Tenney Stadium against Monmouth University. It will be Maris' first conference game of the season. Now to Maris Baseball, we head to reporter Paul Parabello for what to expect this upcoming season and to hear from some of the players themselves on their own expectations. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Parabello, reporting live from Tenney Stadium in Poughkeepsie, New York. Behind me is the men's baseball team. They recently returned from a road trip in which they lost six straight games against Virginia and Furman. Each of the series was closed out in an extra innings loss for the Red Foxes. Despite the slow start, it is way too early to panic. The first six losses were against non-conference opponents, while no MAC team has yet to break 500. Look for junior outfielder Graham McIntyre to carry his team early on. He's gotten off to a scorching start this season with a slash line of 4.48, with a 4.52 on-base percentage and a 7.24 slugging percentage. He leads a team in almost every major offensive category. A lot of talk has also been rumbling about McIntyre's potential entrance into the MLB draft. Here's his assistant coach. Graham's having an unbelievable start to the year. Uh, really, really worked hard in the offseason. He's, he's bought into the philosophy here. And um, he's kind of been the, the spark plug when our offense has been, been rolling for us these first 
a few weeks, he's kind of been in the middle of everything. Um, getting on base, ton of quality at bats, um, and really setting the tone for the offense. The team will look to take advantage of a weak conference for the first time on March 28th against Iona here at home. Hopefully the snow melts by then. For LTCC Sports, this is Paul Parabella. Thanks, Paul, for that Maris baseball update. Coming up next, what should you expect in this year's NCAA tournament? Stay tuned to find out our very own bracket picks. Thanks for joining us at LTCC Sports. We now head to college basketball where it's just about time for the NCAA tournament with Selection Sunday coming up in only a few days. Then next week, the March Madness action is underway. I've already got a few solid picks, but let's start with you, John. Who do you see going far in this year's tournament? Well, there's two teams that definitely come to mind. Uh, Kentucky should be considered a heavy favorite to win, especially since they had an undefeated season and they have just a stacked court with all five positions with unmatched talent. They finished 31-0 and 0, uh, in their season, and they finished 18-0 and 0 in their conference. Uh, they beat ranked teams such as Kansas, Texas, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Louisville. Yet, my favorite would have to be Duke, due to the sheer fact that they have a high-powered center in Jaleel Okafor, who's looking to be probably the number one pick in the draft, who's averaging 17.6 points per game, and 11.8, uh, I'm sorry, 9.2 rebounds per game. And then they also have an overlooked point guard in Tyus Jones, who's averaging 11.8 points per game and 5.7 assists per game. Obviously, the Duke, uh, the Duke Blue Devils can and should be the only team standing in the way of Kentucky's improbable undefeated season. The edge would obviously go to Duke because they just have so much more talent, personally, I would say. And, oh, let's not forget Coach K. Yeah, I would have to pick Kentucky as my favorite as well. They finished the season going a perfect 31-0, and and they certainly look like the best team going into the tournament. John Calipari has this team looking like one of his best, and you know he's adopted this new platoon system where it's spread out the minutes all throughout the team, and everybody's been looking a lot fresher as the season wears on. You know They have very talented big men that also give them a major advantage over most of the players in the NCAA, and Carl Anthony Towns could arguably be the player to supplant Jaleel Okafor at that number one spot in the NBA draft. Um, another team to look out, I would say Villanova. After winning the Big East season title this year, you know, they're primed to get a high seed, maybe a number two, and they'll try and make a run in the tournament. They finished with a record of 29-2, and Big East Coach of the Year Jay Wright has them playing well. They're heading into the tournament 
the Big East tournament where they will take on Marquette later today. Coming off of February where they shot 46% from three-point range, making at least 11 threes in seven of those eight games. Villanova's looking pretty good heading into the tournament. The only knock on them right now would that be, be that their competition maybe has been a little lacking. And so, you know, once they start playing good teams, who knows how they'll hold up. Okay. Well, we'll be right back. But coming up next is local sports. Stay tuned for the Hudson Valley Sports Update. Welcome back and thanks for tuning in. We now go to our Hudson Valley High School Sports Update, where this past weekend, the Saugerties boys basketball team defeated the Red Hook Raiders in the Section 9 Class A championship game with a score of 54 to 53. The Raiders were coming into the game as a number one seed come, and they were going for their second consecutive championship win. But they were not able to hold onto the lead, giving the Saugerties Sawyers their first ever championship title. With 10 seconds left, the Raiders trailed by one and had possession of the ball. Nick Maticic took the final shot that couldn't find the net and the time ticked down as the team scrambled for the ball. Maticic led the Raiders with 18 points but was overmatched by the Sawyers and Pat Gibbs who led the team with 21 points. On to high school track, the New York State Public High School Athletic Association meet was held in Ithaca last weekend where three Dutchess County athletes brought home indoor track championships. Those athletes were Bella Berta and James Asselmeyer for Arlington and Beacon's Rayvon Green. Berta, a sophomore, placed first in the Federation in the girls' indoor 3,000-meter run with a time of 9 minutes and 58 seconds. Asselmeyer also won a Federation title in the boys' 1,000 with a time of 2 minutes and 28 seconds. Gray finished second in the long jump at 23 feet and 1 inch, but still won the public school's title. In local college sports, after beating both the number one and number eight ranked teams last week, the SUNY New Paltz men's volleyball team has moved up to number four in the AVCA Division III Top 15. They were in the number five spot last week and are now 11-3 overall. Junior setter Christian Smith has also been named the AVCA's National Player of the Week. Smith led the team with 33 kills and 60 assists while also recording 17 digs, four aces, three blocks. The Hawks host conference rival New York University tonight at 7 p.m. I'm Ian Lindsay. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for an all new show coming up next week. Have a great day. For John Marrero, take care.
Good show. Yeah, no, that was a great show. Good show. That was a great show.